back to population growth and the logistic curve. In this module, we look at the logistic curve itself. By the end of the module, you will have seen some of its many appealing properties and we'll use this curve to actually model some population. In particular, we'll model the population of the world. Here is the normalized logistic curve. It's somewhat simpler than the full logistic curve, which we'll meet later. Originally due to Pierre-Francois Verhulst back in 1838, who noticed that populations tend to regulate themselves. If you've ever seen mold growing in a petri dish or a population of rabbits, they tend to grow exponentially at first. And then competition for food and space or other resources becomes a problem and the population peters out to some kind of natural limit. That's what we see happening over here. Here we have a graph of the logistic curve. So we have population up here, time over here. We've normalized it so the population eventually grows to one. Initially, things grow quite quickly, only limited by the amount of population there is at the particular time. And after some point, resources become a bit more scarce and the population peters out and eventually grows to this limit of one. In order to understand this curve, let's turn to the exponential function. Up here we have the function just one plus some constant a times e to the negative r, which is another constant, times t, which we can see is this exponential decay curve, limiting to one. So as time gets very large, this curve, this curve here, just goes to one. If we take the reciprocal of this curve, then we have the logistic curve, or the normalized logistic curve. Something interesting happens here at this point where population is half of the full possible population. We'll call this point the midpoint. So we'll define T0 to be where P of T0 is equal to one half. So when population is one half, then this is one over one plus one, which is two. So this auxiliary function up here goes through the point two, which means that this here, or this bit here, a e to the negative rt is just equal to one, which is an interesting fact which we will store aside for later. So a e to the negative r t zero equals one. The logistic curve has many applications in diverse fields. Not only can it be used to model population, but it can also be used to model the growth of a tumour. Initially a tumour will grow quite slowly and then sooner or later the exponential nature of the growth will kick in and the tumour will grow quickly until it starts being limited by physical factors. And then growth peters out as it reaches its maximum possible size. This same phenomenon occurs in the world of economics. If you have an idea, a new idea, you tell people about this idea and no one's ever heard about it before and they tell their friends and no one's ever heard about that before either and initially the growth is quite rapid as it, you can spread this idea to more and more people but sooner or later everyone knows about the idea already so it becomes more difficult to spread this idea to new people so the growth peters out to its natural limit. You, the same phenomenon occurs in social media. If you have a, a famous singer who becomes initially very popular as more and more people start to become fans of this person and eventually again the growth peters out as the number of fans reaches its natural maximum. The logistic curve we've just seen has a rather pleasant derivative and even more interesting things happen at this midpoint t0 as we've defined it. First of all the derivative of the logistic curve dp dt is the derivative with respect to t of our p which we've defined like this now we take the derivative of this, which is negative one, because this is just a function to the power negative one, times by that thing on the bottom squared, and multiply it on the top by the derivative of whatever this denominator was here. And my negatives will cancel. 
I'll bring my R over here. I'll bring one of these, 1 plus AE to the negative Ts over here. And I'll put the other one over there. And what's left is this AE to the negative RT. And the reason I've written it like this is because this term here is just R times P. Recall that P is defined just as 1 over 1 plus AE to the negative RT. So this term here is just P. This term here, mm, well, if I plus 1 over here and minus 1 over here, then I can rewrite this as 1 minus P. So the derivative has this nice form where it's proportional both to P and 1 minus P. And this is what Verhulst originally noticed in 1838. He was interested in populations whose growth was limited both by P and, which is the population at the time, and 1 minus P, which represents the uh, amount of available resources. Initially, when population is small, this term over here goes to 1. So for a small population, we have this differential equation, which we can recognize as that of the exponential curve. So when the population is small, there is no competition for resources, and the amount of population is only limited by how much population there was previously. Eventually, population becomes limited by the availability of resources, and so realistically, this is a more accurate curve. But initially, it does, in fact, look like the exponential curve. As population gets close to 1, this derivative, again, goes close to 0. So it peters out till it as it approaches this natural limit. What is the fastest rate of growth? How big can this possibly be? Here I have the function y equals r times x times 1 minus x. And we can recognize that this will achieve its maximum value at x equals 1 half. And its maximum value will be, well, just r times a half times a half. So that's equal to r and 4. So we've established something quite interesting about this derivative. It achieves its maximum when p is equal to a half, which we recall is the midpoint. So we know that dp dt at our midpoint, t0, is equal to r times a half times a half. So that's r on 4. We've also established something quite interesting, which is that this is the maximum of the derivative, which tells us that the second derivative is 0. So dp squared dt squared at t0 is equal to 0. So this midpoint, where it achieves its fastest rate of growth, is actually a point of inflection, which gives you a way of finding the midpoint. If you have some data, all you have to look for is the point of inflection. And that tells you where the midpoint of your population is. So you can just look at data now and eyeball the midpoint. And that tells you that the population is half its possible maximum. Let's look at another remarkable property of the logistic curve. It's symmetric through the midpoint t0, 1 half. What that means is that every point on this curve over here can be reflected through this midpoint and its reflection occurs back on the curve. This remarkable property allows us to say many interesting things. Having knowledge of the curve up until a point of inflection will enable us to say things about the curve in the future after the point of inflection. Hmm. Excellent. First of all, let's make these definitions precise. The reflection of one point in another point is given like this. What that means is if I reflect this point here, which is on the curve because it's of the form t, p of t, through this other point, t0, 1 half, then I get a third point, which is given here. And this third point is determined as the line through these two points exactly this far along. So this length here is equal to this length here. You can also think about this, this point as being the average of these two points. All we need to do is show that this point's on the curve. So if we take p of this, hopefully we get 1 minus p of t. 
let's start with P of 2 T0 minus T. Well, I plug this into my formula for the logistic curve. That's 1 on 1 plus A e to the negative R times 2 T0 minus T. And I can multiply the top and bottom of this equation by A and I'll get A over A plus A e to the negative R T0 squared e to the RT. And I can clean this equation up using a fact that we stashed away from earlier that A e to the negative RT0 is just 1. So this stuff in here goes away. And we have A on A plus E R T. And I will take this equation here and multiply the top and bottom by E to the negative R T. And that will give me A E to the negative R T over 1 plus A E to the negative R T. Hmm. And if I add 1 here and minus 1 here, then I get 1 minus 1 on 1 plus A E negative R T, which is 1 minus P of T. Exactly what it should have been. So happily, this indeed does in fact lie on the curve because this is set the same as 2 T 0 minus T P of 2 T 0 minus T. Remarkable. This whole curve is symmetric through the midpoint. As I mentioned earlier, this enables us to say things about the future. Having knowledge of where this midpoint is and knowledge of the past up until that point tells us everything there is to know about the future. And we'll use this to estimate world populations. So far we've met the normalised logistic curve. Now let's look at the general case. In the normalised logistic curve, we had a population which grew to a maximum of 1. Now in the general case, we'll have a population that grows to a maximum of k. k being the maximum possible sustainable population. Let's have a look at this picture here. Here we have a population which grows logistically up to k. And this is very similar to the normalised logistic curve, except now we have a maximum population here of k and again we have this halfway point here of k on 2 and the time axis hasn't changed we've taken this function and we've normalized function and we've multiplied it by k to achieve the generalized logistic curve which is what we have up here so this is very similar to the normalized logistic curve except we multiplied through by some constant k multiplying through by this constant k changes some of the properties we've met already, but it doesn't change them very dramatically. We have this differential equation for the generalised logistic curve, which you can actually derive quite easily from the equation we established for the normalised logistic curve. In the normalised case, we had the d, I'll leave a gap, dp dt is equal to r p 1 minus p. This is the differential equation we established in the previous slide. And if I was to multiply through this differential equation by k, then I get kp there, k, and then I have to put a k and a divide by k. And if I put strategic brackets around these kps, then from the differential equation of the normalised logistic curve, I arrive at this differential equation. And all that's changed is that this k term appears down the bottom. If we think about what's happening with as population is small, we see that this is again zero for small population or close to zero. And when population reaches k now, the derivative starts to look more like zero. So we have this same phenomenon where the population is initially quite small and then as it grows to k, it peters off again. The generalised logistic curve has a point of inflection at the halfway point. The halfway point is now at k on 2. So before our halfway point, or our half population was 1 half, and we've scaled it up, so the half population now occurs 
at k on 2. And it still occurs at t0, where t0 is given by this equation here. So this equation hasn't changed. In fact, this equation only involves the t-axis, which we didn't scale. So it makes sense that this shouldn't change. And the amount of population you have at time t0 got multiplied by k. It's still symmetric about this point. So you can see that from the graph, or you can prove directly that this function has this point symmetry about t0 k on 2. This information allows us to make predictions about data which fits a logistic curve. So here we have some world population milestones. The first billion people living concurrently on the world occurred in 1804 and it took some unknown amount of time to get to this first billion. Didn't take too long though to get to the second billion and in 1927, only 123 years later, we had two billion people living on the world. And then things speed up. In 1960, we had three billion people. In only 1974, we had four billion people. In 1987, we had five billion people. In 1999, there were six billion people. And in 2012, there were seven billion people. Let's look a little more closely at what happens in 1999. To begin with, we start with one billion people and it takes a, a long time to get to the next billion and then a shorter time to get to the next billion after that and an even shorter amount of time to get to the next billion after that. The, the time it takes to get between billions is getting shorter. And then over here, the time it takes to get between the billions is getting longer. So in the first half of this graph from a long time ago up until the point 1999, the rate of growth is increasing. It's shorter and shorter time intervals between the billions. And then after 1999, there's longer time intervals between the billions. So we can look at this data and roughly identify that the point of inflection is somewhere around the point 1999. That tells us many wonderful things about world population. If we know that the point of inflection is about 1999, then we know that T0 is about 1999, and there's 6 billion people on the Earth at that time, so K must be 12. So the future possible population of the world is 12 billion people. Symmetry tells us even more. If we know that this is the point of inflection, then it's symmetric about this point, and so we can predict, based on the past, what the future population of the world will be. So if we want to know when will we achieve the 8th billion person, well, it's going to occur 14 years after the 7th billion person, by the symmetry, which means that the 8th billion person will be born in 2026. So in our next module, we'll develop a tool to figure out how well our data fits a logistic curve. So if you're given some information like this and you want to fit it to some lovely looking logistic curve, how well does your data match that curve? We'll have some graphical tools to be able to determine this in the next module.